Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, we'll hit the market from three directions, top-down macro, sector rotation, bottom-up stock picking. We do this every Monday. It's a great way to check in, have a good weekly process for analyzing the overall market. Mega caps continue to be fairly strong, a nice bounce higher today as the S&P bounces off its 50-day moving average from Friday. What does this mean? Do we see signs of further upside or retest the highs or breakdown of support? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets together using the power of stock charts, using data visualization, visualizing investor psychology, investor decision making. You know, I was often asked about what, why price is so important to follow. And for me, as much as we can debate macro headwinds and tailwinds and talk about stimulus and economic shutdowns and a new presidential term and uh, new policy changes, infrastructure spending, all of these sorts of things and many, many more. At the end of the day, price is the best perspective you can get, I would argue, in terms of what investors are actually thinking. And not just what they're thinking, but what they're doing, how they're voting with their capital. This isn't people saying they're bullish or bearish, it's people actually putting their money behind a perspective. And so if you, if you look at nothing else, I would look at price. I would hope you look at other things than price. And as a reminder, we only touch on, you know, some of those other uh, other uh, um, pieces of information. I hope as a well-rounded, as a holistic investor, you think about how the charts fit into an overall process, how you think about fundamental data, macroeconomic data, geopolitical data. Um, you know, for us, it's about, I, I found the, the area that people could use more help with is with uh, is with the data visualization with the charts, and that's what we're focusing on here. We have so many great guests coming through the final bar to help us along the way, trying to make sense of these markets. Tomorrow on Tuesday the second, we have Tony Zhang. Tony's the chief strategist at Options Place. So we'll have a bit of a of an equity derivatives feel to tomorrow. On Wednesday, my friend Louis Giannis, uh, he's the founder of WealthNet Investments, a fellow CMT and uh, one of my favorite quantitative strategists. Uh, looks at the numbers behind stock movements more than anyone. And then finally, on Thursday, Leslie Juflas. Leslie, also CMT. She's one of the frequent guest hosts of Your Daily Five on Stock Charts TV and also the founder of Trading Live Online. Usually a bit of a short-term perspective, so it'll be good to compare her take with the long-term charts that we tend to, tend to focus on on the show. Let's get to our market recap. And as I've mentioned in the introduction, Monday is a great uh, day to look at the three different pieces of equity investing, the three different perspectives, top down, bottom up, and sector rotation in the middle. My goal, I hope that I give you ideas that allows you or encourages you, inspires you to dig deeper on all of these charts. We only have time to touch on many different uh, perspectives, many different charts in 30 minutes, but hopefully this is what helps you to think about what other charts you should be digging in a little deeper as you think about your own process. Let's start with the big picture, start with the macro point of view. And, you know, Friday, the show, if you listen to Friday's Wrap the Week segment, it was pretty much uh, things turning from bullish to neutral or neutral to bearish, sort of the, the euphoric sentiment that has lightened up looks very similar to market tops. The breadth readings that have been very supportive over the last week have turned more negative. And you're starting to see some divergences, momentum divergences as well, with higher highs in price on stocks like Tesla and others, but lower peaks in the RSI. And so for me, that mosaic sort of paints a rather bearish picture for stocks. However, on Friday, we also talked about hitting the 50-day moving average. And all was about this week, do we bounce off of that? Do we find support at the 50-day or do we follow through and indicate further downside? Well, today was certainly a uh, on the bounce camp with the S&P up 1.6%, up a little bit more. It came off a bit in the last hour, but still finishing toward the highs of the day and, and pretty constructive. The NASDAQ 100 even further up 2.5%, as you'll see when we look at the FANG stocks, the FANMAG stocks, tech, consumer discretionary, certainly uh, showing some strength today, bouncing off of a, of a weaker level going into uh, Friday's close. 
Mid caps and small caps led the way higher as well. So this is certainly a, in a one day snapshot, you know, uh, sort of alleviating that risk off feel that we had, I think Wednesday through Friday of last week certainly felt like a change of character from bullish market to bearish market if I had to declare one side or the other, but a nice bounce today. And so again, no matter what, even if I think the market keeps going further, and I think the S&P will retest 3,200 would be my guess uh, before all is said and done. Even if that does happen, uh, or if it doesn't, I think a day like today makes perfect sense. After Wednesday through Friday, testing the 50-day, totally reasonable to have a bounce today. It's now about the next one, right? Does tomorrow and Wednesday continue to follow through to the downside? Or do we get a bit of support here? Do we, uh, do we bounce around a lot? Now, there are a lot of potential catalysts this week. I mean, last week we had three out of the FanMag stocks reporting earnings. Tomorrow we have Alphabet, Amazon both coming out. Also some biotech, uh, healthcare like Pfizer, like Amgen. Uh, continuing through the week, PayPal, Qualcomm, um, you know, Merck. I mean, there's some there's some big names that are reporting this week, and you know, I don't I don't know if earnings has been the ultimate catalyst to what what's been happening because something like Microsoft does does well earnings wise, and then the stock comes off that day. Although overall, it's holding up pretty well to be to be fair, but you know, potential catalyst. So let's look at the charts and think about what they uh, what they might be telling us about the big picture. Uh, the VIX back down, uh, testing 30 uh, on the way back down. Bonds essentially really flat for the day. Ten-year yields came off a little bit, but not a lot of movement there. And the dollar a uh, little bit higher. Silver certainly, uh, if you if you missed that big gap higher, this is sort of the latest, um, you know, Reddit short squeeze sort of target is uh, silver prices, the silver future, the SOV certainly bouncing up and closing about seven percent higher. The big move was uh, was overnight essentially, so gapped up and. Uh, traded almost to 28 and finished more toward the you know lower third of the day, sort of weaker than it had been at the uh, at the open, but certainly gapping higher. Gold moving up a little bit, about one percent, uh, I think, in concert with with silver prices. What's interesting to me though is commodities as a whole. It's not just silver prices; it's energy stocks, energy prices going higher, natural gas that's going higher, uh, soft commodities, right. Um, uh, and, and so forth. So, you know, it's certainly, uh, you know, it's not just silver, it's uh, it's ag, it's energy, it's a lot of different things. And we're going to look at a chart of the DBC a little later. This is the, uh, one of the commodity index ETFs that we track. Uh, cryptocurrency is a little bit mixed, but overall Bitcoin finishing stronger, about 1.8%. Uh, over the weekend, spiked up to uh, above 38,000 before settling down back just below 34,000 into, uh, into the close today. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. So as we mentioned, you know, the warning signs that we got through Friday's close, which again, even though today was a nice bounce, absolutely right. Even though we traded uh, certainly in a position of strength, finished toward the highs of the day, I agreed none of that is negative. However, let's put it all in perspective. We did not close above Friday's uh, open, right? So we actually didn't even make up the ground that we lost on Friday. We bounced off the 50 day, which is totally fair. Again, I think if we continue on to new highs or if we continue this trend uh, lower, a bounce off of a major moving average makes a ton of sense. The question is always what happens next? What happens after that um, sort of bounce? I think the path of least resistance remains lower. And I would say that based on the fact that we've broken down through trend line support, based on the fact that we've broken down through the most recent swing low, and I think Friday's close sort of solidified that, I will absolutely tell you I'm wrong if we make it to new highs. And, and I'll tell you that the uh, the path is clear to continue to push higher. I think just given all the divergences, given the weakening breadth, given the euphoric sentiment that's alleviated, that to me, all you know, my playbook tells me that's uh, those are topping patterns. And you bounce around, you move around, and it's all about where we're at relative to key support and resistance. Let's see if the 50-day holds. If it does, uh, the trend continues higher. If not, though, and again, I think the fact that we've broken trend line support and the most recent swing low to me tells me we have a little bit more at least before we would uh, before we need to uh, we, we'll be able to return higher. For me, the line in the the sand is sort of my first target would be this 38.2% retracement. It's just below 36. Uh, 50, you call it 3630. That would be the swing lows from December. Uh, and I think that could be a reasonable place uh, to pull back to before all is uh, said and done, if not lower. And I mentioned on Friday, I could see a pull, you know, a, a move down to the 3200 range. I think that'll happen before we resolve sort of this consolidation phase. But again, that can be a multi week, month, multi month sort of choppy pattern. I don't, I don't think necessarily it means we hit there this week. Uh, but we certainly could, and it's all about the uh, the price support and whether it can hold. 
So overall, that is the big picture environment. Again, just touching on the uh, on the overall theme. Again, a nice bounce today. I still think the path of least resistance is lower until proven otherwise. You make a higher low, um, you start to eclipse. Uh, you know, you you do not uh, fail through the 50-day moving average. I think I'll uh, I'll certainly be telling you that that uh, less negative than I may have uh, may have expected. Let's continue on this discussion from macro perspective to sectors. Uh, it's always helpful to look at the 11 S&P sectors, how they rotate around the benchmark. If you missed my conversation with Julius De Kempner last week, I think that was on Wednesday's uh, show. I'd encourage you to check out our uh, YouTube channel, check out Wednesday's episode because uh, it was a really good discussion and uh, and Julius focused in, I think, some really key movements within some of the offense that we've talked about. We focused on this cluster here. This is the weekly RRG showing the 11 sectors rotating around the benchmark in the middle. If you look a little bit right of center, center you have this cluster of technology, consumer discretionary, and communication services. Worth noting, since we recorded that in the last week, uh, technology now the first, the only of the three to return back to the leaning quadrant. So which of the 11 sectors is heading in the direction of appreciation northeast and is in the leading quadrant? There's only one, and it's technology. So you know, with all of the movement, with all the rotation, with growth versus value, with large versus small, all of those discussions we have, it's worth noting that the technology sector XLK certainly in, in terms of overall rotation and improvement on a relative basis on the long term. I think technology may be the best one for that. Now, further to the right means it's been a stronger performer up until now. That's why energy and financials doing pretty well. Materials and adjustments we've talked about for a while, but look at how they are heading southwest, sort of the direction of deterioration, I would call that. So in terms of improving, in terms of opportunistic, I would highlight technology and I would highlight healthcare, actually, which is over here on the left side of the, uh, of the y-axis, but heading in the right direction. Now let's look very quickly at the daily rotation here just to see what sort of things we can have. Things have continued to rotate here. And in terms of what's improved in the short term, I would just highlight three, um, the uh, real estate sector, the communication services sector, the technology sector. It's not to say that in other sectors, there aren't some stocks that are bouncing, some stocks that show some pretty decent signs of, uh, of overall potential, but these on a relative basis uh, are, are where things are headed. Real estate is a really interesting one because I think this is a sector that people love to forget. If you know your sort of index history, your market history, and boy, I wish I knew, having said that, I wish I remember the date when this happened, but this was probably eight, 10 years ago, maybe not that far ago when uh, real estate broke off of financials. I probably guess it was like 2014-ish, 2015. Uh, real estate had been part of financials and it was basically just a really boring, defensive, small market cap uh, part of, uh, of financials, but really is a different sector. REITs sort of trade uh, separately. They've broken out on their own. And, and, and as a result, it's relatively small. They're not, they don't tend to be super exciting. So people forget about them. However, they tend to pay a pretty decent yield. They tend to be relatively stable. Again, the coronavirus whole experience over the last year has shocked a number of these, but you see how they're rotating more positively. So maybe worth if you've ignored them completely, maybe take a look and see if there's some opportunities within there. Here's a chart of the XLRE. And again, it's not my favorite chart in terms of the long-term relative performance. You can see that the relative strength over the last year has been pretty dismal, really going into the first week in January. But this is why it's improving so much on the RRG. Look at how it's upturned here in the last uh, three to four weeks. And you can see bouncing off the 200 day, the XLRE is actually uh, testing a new you know, call it a 12 month uh, high almost, maybe an, a 10, 11 month high, I actually still haven't broken above these uh, uh, these closes from uh, from the February peak, but on its way to try to retest those uh, those peaks from February of, uh, of 2020. Uh, that's real estate. A number of sectors are actually testing their 50 day moving average, just like the S&P. And, you know, when the S&P, when the index is doing a particular thing, I always find it's helpful to look layers below that, right? Look under the hood. That's why we look at breadth, because that's a way of understanding the characteristics of, uh, you know, of participation, how many stocks and what types of stocks are participating in that up move. Also, it's looking at sectors, it's looking at um, industries, it's looking at particular stocks and seeing what they're doing. Because if the S&P is holding above its 50-day, but most things are breaking below their 50-day, I would argue things are not as healthy as they might seem. So let's pay attention this week to a number of these sectors that are pulling back to their 50-day. The XLF is maybe one of the, the most important ones. Now, just like the S&P, if you take a trend line from the last couple of months, we've broken down through trend line support. We are now, in this case, I would argue, testing 
this swing low here from late December. The real good one here is, is uh, around 28. That's from mid-December. But, you know, we're sort of in that rounding error. We're testing the 50-day as well. My question would be, does the 50-day moving average uh, hold? If you look across the candle glance page, you can see a number of sectors are in that same boat. Consumer discretionary, testing its 50-day moving average, communication services, energy, materials, technology. These are all um, sectors that call out healthcare, arguably as well, not quite there, but really, really close. These are all uh, ETFs, sector ETFs that are pulling back to an ascending 50-day moving average. Those 50 days hold and the prices bounce back higher off an ascending 50-day moving average. That's very, very constructive. If we see more and more of what we saw with industrials, and again, what concerns me is when sectors do not hold that. So the XLI, unable to hold its 50 day and now breaking down through its December low. That's kind of a concern. Um, you know, uh, what else? Uh, industrials we just uh, talked about. It's consumer staples. Now, again, more of a defensive sector. Absolutely right. You can see same thing here. Broke down through the 50 day, tested it from below and now breaking lower. So certainly from a relative perspective, I, I think of that as more of, a, of an avoid. Um, so you've seen with industrials, with staples, a couple sectors that have broken down and have been unable um, to, ha to hold support. I think what's really key are things like technology, consumer discretionary. These are the fan mag stocks. These are the uh, leadership sectors. These are the growthy sectors that arguably could be a real uh, strong, uh, real key story through 2021. Um, these are, uh, you know, in, at times have been good offense and good defense. These are, um, you know, uh, names that overall over the long term have been great relative winners testing the 50 day and as of today, bouncing off of, uh, of support. Do those hold through the course of this week? Do we see failures there? If we see failures there, you will hear me get louder and louder about the uh, increasing potential for further downside. At this point, it's sort of the, uh, the line in the sand that uh, so far we appear to be, uh, to be able to hold. That's our uh, sector setups for uh, today for Monday the 1st. Let's take a quick commercial break. Back with my next segment, Shifting Stocks. We'll see you in a minute. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. So good to have you join us every weekday after the close as we review these markets together. And again, my, my goal is not to give you the answers, it's to help you focus on some of the questions that you should be trying to answer. And, and again, helping you along your journey of analyzing charts, of trying to make sense of the markets, of trying to learn to be a more mindful, more effective investor using charts, using uh, technical analysis, data visualization. Please think of us as a resource as you run into questions along the way about the markets, about technical analysis, about stock charts, market dynamics, whatever it is, we'll do our best to, uh, to help you out. Shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. Uh, on Twitter, just tag us in a comment at finalbarsctv, or on our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We'd love to hear from you. We have another mailbag segment on Tuesday's show, and we would love to answer your question on the air. Our next segment is called Shifting Stocks. So again, on Mondays, we do the macro take, which we started with. We then get to the sectors and we've seen some of these offensive sectors, some of these uh, you know, strong, traditionally relatively strong sectors like technology and consumer discretionary testing key support. My question through this week and beyond, or do, do we hold support in these sort of things? Again, overall, if you ask me to uh, you know, anticipate what is the more likely outcome, I would argue we have further to go to the downside before this is over, given the weakness and breadth, given the weakening sentiment, given the price breakdowns that we've seen so far, and just the general frothiness with a lot of things. If you ask anyone that's been in the industry for a while to rate a subjective frothiness level based on what we are seeing and hearing, I've, I've not spoken to anyone who does not put it very, very high uh, and I know for me being uh, doing this for 20, 20 and a half years now, uh, it's pretty, pretty extreme. And then to me, that seems weaker rather than stronger. However, it's all about price and it's about whether we hold levels or not. And we'll have to see what happens. Now, our discussion about shifting stocks usually takes a lot of different forms. And it really is driven by my own process of, of analyzing a bunch of individual stocks and just thinking about what would be key things to share with you. We're going to hit on a number of different random uh, charts given the time that we have here through the uh, through the end of the show. I'll start with the Fan Mag stocks. Uh, and for me, it starts with the New York Fang Plus Index. This is sort of Fang plus some other things that are Fang-ish or Fang-like. 
Um, and so you can see the relative performance of this index has been exceptionally strong. This is, you know, even starting at the March low, this has been a great group of stocks to bet on because overall uh, they've been in a pretty, pretty strong position. I think what's interesting right now is just seeing, just like we did with the sector, seeing where all of these are at in their phases. And I would argue some of them much more constructive than others. What are the most constructive, the most positively positioned FANG stocks? I would say two of them are FAN mag stocks, two of the, out of the six, certainly the, the strongest by, by any uh, definition. Microsoft, arguably the strongest because it's broken above resistance now in the last week, I think was key, pushing above 230, now bouncing back on Friday and today sort of rotating back higher. So overall, it's actually in a pretty good, pretty good place as long as it holds 230 on any sort of pullback. Overall, it's this nice base and breaking out higher. Alphabet, another one that's actually already broken out, broken above resistance, now pulled back, tested it, and now rotating back higher. So just given today's strength, they certainly appear to be pulling out and, and continuing upwards uh, after that. Apple and Netflix would be maybe the next tier. These are ones that at this point, I would argue that they're more failed breakouts. This was a beautiful cup and handle pattern that did not get above that breakout level. It sort of gapped up or didn't really gap, it just pushed higher and then was not able to eclipse that breakout days high. And now it's sort of pulled back a little bit. Netflix, same thing, gapped up, had the ability to get above its previous highs for the last six months plus, and actually has been, uh, has been repelled there. So you have a couple charts that have had failed breakouts. Then you have the two that are sort of mid range. That would be Amazon here. And again, it's not bad. It's just less constructive. It's not testing new highs. It hasn't gotten above there. It's just sort of mid range. And then Facebook would be the last one. It's actually the only one really testing its 50 day at the moment. So, you know, overall, I think you have two that are pretty strong. You have two that were strong, but now are, you know, are failed breakouts. And the question is, can you resume that uptrend or uh, have we hit the, uh, the peak for now? And then the other two are more mid-range, have not been able to, uh, to materialize. I think thinking about a stronger market from here, I would need to see improvement on some of these charts. I, I would think if and when the market continues lower, I could see these uh, continue to outperform being a bit of a safe haven of sorts. This is where I, I would expect people would, especially institutional investors, would want to park um, some assets and ride out whatever downside we might see. Um, I could see these uh, these stocks, you know, holding up or pulling back a bit on an absolute basis, but doing continue to do well on a relative basis. Another group of stocks to think about are what I call the MVP stocks, and I I didn't make that up. I saw that somewhere, and forgive me for not whoever made that up. I think that was a great way of describing them. I forget where I saw that, but apologies for that. Um, uh, there's an ETF that kind of tracks this. Uh, sort of mobile payments group, IPAY. It's it's weighted not exactly in just these three stocks. It has other things, but um, that's the performance of it. You can see overall has been pretty strong, but year to date has not been great. And if you look at two of the larger names in, uh, in an ETF like this, it's MasterCard and Visa. Uh, and overall, you can see they really topped out in September and have not been able to get above there. Uh, Visa just momentarily going into the end of the year looked like it was going to break higher. And then similar to some of the like apples uh, that, that, that attempted to break out and then failed, this one has actually continued lower. And the last month has been relatively weak. You can see on a price basis, both of those two have come back. Look at the difference between those two charts and PayPal at the bottom. And you can see why this is a much more constructive pattern. Visa and MasterCard, lower highs. Uh, 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 hard to actually say that because it really hasn't had a meaningful high. Lower lows, though, having broken below support from December. PayPal, however, is uh, remaining above it, has not made a lower low yet. Visa and MasterCard have broken below their 50-day moving average. PayPal has not. It's actually just bounced uh, uh, back off of it uh, from, uh, from last week. So overall, PayPal out of the three, certainly uh, the MVP of the MVP stocks, if you will, uh, but overall, that might be a group to uh, to watch as well. Be interested to see if you're able to get, get some appreciation there. But overall, you'd want to see some sort of accumulation. We haven't seen it yet. Um, you know, just jumping around randomly, and sorry, I'm just kind of hitting on uh, tickers that jumped out during my process. I, you know, a chart like this is one that it's hard for me to get anything like excited about because it's failed uh, to hold support, right? You made a higher high there in November, another higher high in December. And from there, it's made a series of lower highs. Each bounce higher has been lower than the previous bounce. It's broken down through its October low. It's also broken down through the first Fibonacci support, which is right about the same level. It's also broken down through the 200 day moving average. So in the last two weeks, Verizon went from bouncing off the 200 day to basically continuing getting a lower low every day for the last five trading days. Now, what's interesting about a chart like this, and this is why when I think of bottom fishing candidates, this is the kind of thing I'm looking at. Um, is it in an uptrend? Absolutely not. Would it be my idealized chart? Absolutely not. 
Is it nearing a potential support level? Sure, it bottomed out in May and June around this same level, and this is adjusted for dividends. So unadjusted, it may not be exactly the same, but uh, worth looking at that as well. That also lines up with the 61.8% retracement level. It's also just become oversold, which if you look like last year, uh, last October, you became oversold, you had another move lower. That's when you had the higher low, the bullish divergence, and then the price bounced higher. So it's sort of on the watch list uh, after underperforming, after breaking down through support, does it hold and you have you know fairly low risk? You basically have risk down to the previous lows in Fibonacci support and potential upside of going much further. Um, so again, not my favorite uh, idea of a, of, a, of, a, of a chart. I'd much rather own charts that are outperforming than underperforming, but a high yielding stock nearing support and oversold for me just could, sort of gets it on my watch list of something to think about. Virgin Galactic has certainly gone higher. I tend to avoid some of these uh, you know, high flying pun intended uh, names. But again, when, and I'm asked, what do you do when a stock has done this? And I would argue, as long as we keep making higher highs and higher lows, the trend is positive. It's once again, extremely overbought, which for me usually means you might get a pullback, but overall there's enough momentum to most likely continue to push this higher. The concern is, does something happen there like what happened with Stitch Fix? What happens when a stock gets overextended? It's not the overbought conditions that get you, it's the bearish divergences. And this is what we're arguably seeing with Tesla, with um, Plug Power, which has been our top ranked uh, mid cap stock. This is actually second in the mid cap scooter rankings behind uh, Plug Power. And this is Stitch Fix and you can see the higher highs in price December and January, the lower peaks and RSI now we're pulling back. The kicker though, is we're still making a higher high and a higher low. The challenge with a name like this is we can get all the way down to 55. We can go another 30 points lower, 33 or so percent, 30% down from current levels and still be making a higher low. So it's not a great, uh, it's not necessarily a great measure. So overall, I think it certainly is giving the signals of, of an uptrend that is maybe made it played its course. I think looking for a lower high might be a, a potential warning of a downturn, looking at some trend lines, even looking at an hourly chart to see if it's able to hold some of the support levels there could be, uh, could be key. Finally, I just want to point out, if you're looking for a way to track some of these uh, sort of, uh, you know, the short sell names, the, um, you know, the names that have been in the news that a lot of people have tracked, I set up an ACP watch list just as a way to track these during the day and be able to click on them very quickly and find the changes. You know, what's interesting about a lot of these, we'll maybe get into this in the mailbag tomorrow. A lot of these, you'll see a lot of solid candles, which means even though we might have been trading higher, you're closing below the open. That is certainly more distributive and it indicates selling during the day, not accumulation during the day. So it may be something to pay attention to with some of these names that have had incredible runs in the last couple of weeks. We need to wrap the show, go to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the DBC, the commodity index. There are a couple of different indexes that you can track. The CRB index is, is maybe the most common. Uh, GCC, DBC, these are all different ETFs and indexes that track overall commodities. They differ in terms of how they're weighted. And a lot of times it's how much is weighted toward crude oil that really changes the, uh, the, the context of these. But it's worth noting the commodity complex had a fantastic run out of an April low, had this bull flag pattern. And if you take the uh, trajectory there, measures back to the previous highs. When we originally saw that back here, that seemed crazy that the uh, DBC would get back to its January highs. That's not far away. That's a you know less than a point away on the on the DBC. So you know, nice rotation higher, continuing to make higher highs and higher lows. I think the bull market in commodities is not over yet. Technology sector number two, the XLK. I like the fact that this went from sort of uh, sideways to underperforming to now once again making higher lows in its relative strength, trying to make a higher high in relative strength is still above an upward sloping 50 day moving average. You know, arguably, what's the one chart you might look at to decide whether or not the market's going to, uh, you know, move materially lower? I would argue the XLK holding its 50 day might be a, as good as any uh, as, as a way of sort of tracking that overall health. And again, I could see the XLK outperforming even with an underperforming uh, or, or, or a down tick in, uh, in stock prices. I think the S&P goes lower. I could see a lot of people parking in something like, uh, like technology names, the mega cap stocks to try to ride something out. Finally, I'll highlight the chart of GameStop. And again, for me, when I'm asked about, you know, where do charts add value, I would argue something like GameStop, while it's certainly a 
um, you know, a structural dynamic that's causing these stock prices. At the end of the day, it's euphoria and desperation that's actually fueling the decision to buy or sell. What concerns me on the GME chart, if anything, besides the fact that it's gone up so much, is the fact they have a lot of solid candles. What that means is we're closing below the open every day. Folks, that is our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.